Welcome back to the CUNE Academy, where we're not just learning history, we're making history. All right, that song will actually make sense, believe it or not, if any of you know your 1970s music, as we phase out of the 70s and into the 80s. Okay, so during the 70s, uh, um, a big movement is uh, kind of spurned called the religious right, which are people that are conservatives that want to return to traditional family values, kind of similar to the 80s or, or 1920s with the Scopes trial, the Klan, not to compare them to the Klan, but people that want to go back to more traditional family values, American family, that kind of stuff. This is a revolt against the sexual revolution, the hippies, and things like that. So you start to see a big tide of people called the religious right, mostly in the South, in what's called the Bible Belt, all right, which is the basically southern states of the confederacy through texas pushing for things like prayer in school um, more pro-life policies okay family values okay um i will say anti um gay rights as well okay so a big push uh, amongst these uh conservative religious groups mostly evangelical christians Okay, and the name you'll probably want to know about with that is a guy named Reverend Jerry Falwell. Okay, he actually goes to jail in the 1980s for some uh, mistakes he makes, um, along with some other prominent religious leaders. But they really sprang up in the 70s and 80s through uh, the medium of television. They were actually called televangels, which are evangelical Christians trying to spread Christianity through television. So that's the term televangel televangelical. All right, that's Jerry Falwell. He's kind of the Symbolic leader of the religious right, there's also a Reverend Billy Graham that was a little less conservative. And here you see a, um, a pro-life rally outside the Capitol, all right, promoting um, an overturn of Roe versus Wade. This was kind of the, the main issue of the religious right. And they're going to help Ronald Reagan become president um, in 1980, all right? So we see the Equal Rights Amendment, which in 1982 fails, all right, by one vote, which is the state of Illinois. Okay, and um, that was actually led by a lot of women, most notably Phyllis Shafley. And then the abortion controversy still stems out of this, and you see a big push um, to get conservatives put on the Supreme Court that are willing to overturn Roe versus Wade. And Reagan, when he gets elected, is going to appoint four conservative justices. There's Phyllis Shafley leading the Stop ERA campaign. This is in the Capitol building in Illinois. Okay, um, they would actually bake cookies and give them to the legislators as they walked in to remind them of the woman's traditional role that they did not want to see changed and see the American family kind of totally upended was their big concern uh, with that. Okay, and there's kind of a tax revolt leading into the election of 1980. All right, when Reagan takes office, the highest income tax rate is 70%. All right, so basically for every dollar you made, you paid 70 cents to the government. Um, that was for the highest of the high earners, okay? And Reagan wants to reduce those taxes for everybody. That's part of his Reaganomics philosophy. And the reason for such high taxes was that was the way to promote this government spending out of the great society, continue the New Deal programs, and also kind of limit inflation, because if there's less spending, there's going to be less um, higher prices. Okay, so in the election of 1980, Reagan wins pretty handily, okay? Carter was from Georgia. His VP, Walter Mondale, was from Minnesota. And um, Maryland and West Virginia, not really sure what their issue is. Hawaii's always Democratic, okay? So Reagan is a big push. He wins 91% of the electoral vote, a total landslide. But you can see it's only 51% of the uh, popular vote. This guy, John Anderson, got 7% as a third-party candidate, arguing Reagan was too conservative. So Anderson was a moderate Republican in that election. Don't need to worry about John Anderson, but um, know that Reagan wins an electoral landslide and then proceeds to push his conservative agenda. Okay? Basically, Reaganomics okay, is to cut spending, which didn't happen because even though Reagan controlled the presidency, a Republican, okay, the uh, Democrats controlled Congress, and they were not going to do the spending cuts that Reagan had wanted. Okay? So cut spending, cut taxes, in what is known as trickle-down economics. That's probably what Eric Foner calls it because it's kind of a neg negative term because the idea is that the money trickles down from the rich to the poor if you cut their taxes. Um, the technical definition of that is supply-side economics, and that is this notion of giving the money to the companies, the corporations, the wealthy, cut their taxes, 
so they will spend more money. And this actually works in the 1960s. This idea came from Kennedy and Johnson as a way to fund the Great Society. So, because um, what the theory is, is that if you cut taxes, you're going to generate more revenue. All right? And the rationale for that is that if you have people having more money in their pockets, they're going to spend more. And if they spend more, there's going to be more taxes that they're paying, more jobs they're creating, more people working, and eventually will solve the deficit. It worked for Johnson and started to work for Reagan, and then um, the spending got completely out of control. Okay? Um, we see a big problem of inequality. Foner calls this the second Gilded Age. I lived through this and have never heard that term in my life. But um, kind of implies that things looked rosy and bright. Things were great in the 80s. You know, the fifth grade kid living in Rolling Meadows gets an Atari, a VCR, cable television, all these cool things, pool in his backyard. But in reality, we're still struggling to make ends meet. We're borrowing more money than ever. And our homes are losing value, et cetera. Okay? Here's a term you might uh, need to know called the yuppie, which stood for young urban professional. And this was, you know, um, these people didn't want to get married until later in life, live in the cities, okay, have the good big city life. You see the nanny in the background taking care of the kids and then them having the lavish lifestyle and the fancy wood floors and all that kind of stuff. All right, and another big problem of the 80s was something, this is why I played Jet Airliner, was um, in 1978, the Congress deregulates the airline industry. When I was a kid, you literally had three airlines that were noted, United Airlines, American Airlines, and TWA, because they basically had a monopoly on the airline industry, and it became very hard for the government to allow other companies to get into the airline business. And you can look. It looks like they're flying first class. They got a nice sweet table there, champagne, all that kind of stuff, flying in luxury in these fancy airlines. And when uh, they deregulate the airline industry, the government basically takes a lot of the regulations and the rules out of what it takes to become an airline. And you see things spring up like Southwest and Delta and these other new airlines to compete. And what happens when you deregulate the airlines is the prices go way down. Okay, But then you also have less government involvement in that as well. Okay. Um, for that. So that's a big reason why like Southwest only flies out of Midway because when the government deregulated, they allowed Southwest to exist, but they had uh, certain rules they had to follow and only certain airports they could go into um, where O'Hare kind of stayed as the dominant airline um, airport in Chicago. Okay. Um, see the real income changing. Okay. This is one of the criticism of Reagan's. Um, the rich got richer because you're giving them tax breaks. Okay. Poor people also got tax breaks, but the money really didn't make it down to them um, was kind of the criticism of that. So this is a little bit of a biased document, but the statistics are true. Okay. Uh, divorce rates. All right. You look, um, this is the number of divorces. It looks like per thousand marriages. All right, and 1950, very few. That number is going to triple by 1980. This is kind of the consequence of that feminist movement and kind of that push for independence uh, and things like that that, uh, that come out of that. Uh, and now I believe the divorce rate is 51%. So, yes, the leading cause of divorce in this country is marriage. It's supposed to be funny. All right, um, so the conservatives and Reagan. Reagan uh, kind of comes in on his conservative tide, appoints four new justices to swing the court into uh, his favor, okay, for the most part, and you'll start to see some of the effects of that in the 90s and more um, Supreme Court decisions favoring businesses, favoring states' rights, okay, and stuff like that. Uh, not so much on the moral side of things. Prayer in school was still declared unconstitutional. They never overturned Roe versus Wade, um, things like that. And then Reagan makes a big push to take on the Soviets and the evil empire, which I'm going to switch to red here for the evil empire. And Reagan's push is to end detente, and essentially end the Cold War by uh, outspending the Russians. So that was his plan. We were going to build up our nuclear arsenal. There was a big popular thing called the MX missile that uh, sprang up during this time. Uh, it was a nuclear missile that could, could shoot interballistically or intercontinentally across the country and see if you can outspend the Russians and cripple their economy, and then they would have to... Um, have open reforms to become more of a market economy was his plan. And he met with uh, the Soviet leader, Mikhail um, Gorbachev, all right, who you see here in Red Square. And Reagan was trying to work out arms deals. A big thing that he had pushed was something called Star Wars. And this is a genius move. This is not Luke Skywalker and Chewbacca and all that other stuff that you should watch because you're cultured kids. But um, this was an idea that you could have um, a missile defense system in outer space, okay? 
Now, this never happened. This was unfathomable. But the idea was that you would have missiles in outer space that could shoot down Russian nuclear missiles and protect us in this country. Okay? And Reagan was convinced that this could work, so he told his aides to start researching this and prove that we could have it happen. What was genius about it was when they start negotiation with the Russians about reducing the arms, the first thing the Soviets want to get rid of is Star Wars. And they said, get rid of this missile defense system. Because the minute we have a missile defense system, we can shoot missiles at them Anything they shoot at us is going to be knocked down. All right, so if Reagan says, all right, we won't build the Star Wars, well, then Soviet Union says, okay, well, then we'll get rid of 100 nuclear warheads. What did we give up? Absolutely nothing. What did the Soviets give up? 100 nuclear warheads. Okay, so it ended up being a genius move, but something that never really came to fruition very much. We had a smaller thing come out of that in the, in the Gulf War. Okay, Rand Contra affair is something you definitely need to know. All right, and you know why I'm telling you that. It's pretty complicated. Okay, you have Iran over here. Okay, they're our enemy, don't forget, because uh, of the hostage crisis, all right? And then you have a lot of t um, terrorists in the Middle East that are keeping Americans hostages, all right? Lebanon was a big place where this was happening in Syria and places like that. So these Middle Easterners were taking Americans that were in these countries as terrorists, all right? Now you have the United States over here, and down here you have the country of Nicaragua. Okay, and Nicaragua is having a civil war between the communists and the capitalists. So what Reagan decides to do is he wants to give money to the Nicaraguans, but our Congress will not let them because the last country we gave money to to fight communism was old Vietnam. And how'd that turn out? You guessed it. So what um, what this plan that come, comes up that's devised and Reagan never said he had knowledge of it. He was never tied into this. But the plan was these Nicaraguans, which had a group called the Contras, they were fighting against the communists. The communists were called the Sandinistas. I'm not going to attempt to write that on the board. I'm just going to write S-A-N-D there. Okay. So the Contras against the Sandinistas who were the communists. So somebody in Reagan's White House decided that they were going to sell weapons to Iran. Okay who was fighting a war with Iraq at the time, okay? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. We liked Saddam Hussein during that. And then the deal was the money that was made from the profits of Iran, okay, would then be funneled into Nicaragua to help these Contras fight against the communists there, okay? And Iran would then go to these terrorist groups and get our hostages released, okay? So money to Iran. Iran tells Lebanon and, and the... PLO, as it was called, Palestine Liberation Organization, to release these American hostages so they can go home. And then the profits from the money we made to Iran would get sent to these Nicaraguans. Totally illegal. Almost sent Ronald Reagan to impeachment and almost, or actually did put some people in jail. Okay. It's confusing, and I don't want to take up too much more of your video time talking about that. All right. Reagan leaves office. Very popular. Very excited president. That's the bell. Okay. And George Bush takes over in 18, 1989, continuing the conservative revolution. Mr. Kuhn becomes a senior in high school. And, um, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. So thank you for listening to the Kuhn Academy. That closes out the 80s. We're going to do the 90s next week. And have a wonderful weekend.